All right, I got some thumbs up. Thank you very much. The next lecture, we're going to backtrack and we're going to talk about lecture nine, which is on n dimensional space. And we're going to, I'm going to head to the lecture page here on n dimensional space. And I really, we're, rather than showing you the slides, which are available right here on the page, we're just going to kind of talk about my summary of this chapter and and then talk a little bit about how it impacts us and what I think Hamming was at least trying to get us to understand from this lecture. So once again, kind of the central theme is that we build three-dimensional objects, but their design is going to be in a higher dimensional space where we have one dimension for every design parameter. Okay, and Hamming begins his lecture by talking about the fact that, you know, we live in three dimensions, but our interactions really don't occur in three dimensions. They occur in a two-dimensional space because our natural tendency is to fix at least one of these parameters, which what we would call dimensionality reduction, right? And it reduces our complexity. And so the first thought question that I had for the group was, you know, let's think about, talk about ways that we reduce dimensionality in our everyday lives. And, you know, the, he, Hamming gave an example of, you know, you put the airplanes on a taxiway and now they have the potential to collide because they're really now moving in two dimensions, you know, and we do that when we walk, you know, just the fact that everyone is kind of grounded on the earth, we're really only moving in two dimensions. And, you know, my, my PhD was on the evacuation of people from buildings, doing actually simulations of the evacuation of people from buildings. And, even though we modeled buildings in three dimensions, it really was a two-dimensional problem moving people in the X and the Y direction because they always had to be on a floor or on a stair or on some solid object in that Z direction. And, you know, I was thinking this morning, you know, we kind of reduce dimensionality when we bake, right? So maybe we measure our stuff or we set our oven to a certain temperature and hopefully it stays there. Um, we buy specific kinds or brands of flour and sugar because maybe it makes the stuff taste better or not. You know, so I was just going to kind of open it up for discussion. What are some other ways that you can think of that we reduce dimensionality in our lives? I'm not so sure about reducing in day-to-day -day life kind of stuff, but I know my dissertation is leveraging reducing the dimensionality of motion through time and space, which is a four-dimensional problem, crunching that down into a static three-dimensional problem, effectively making you know, significant chunks of the long-term problem easier. Excellent. Thank you, Lauren. Any others? Toby? I remember something from my electric uh, engineering uh, study some 40 years ago. I think uh, everything what has to do with coding, like QAM, the Qu Quadrature Amplitude Modulation 256 for terrestrial distribution of broadcasting. I think all this stuff is also four or five dimensions, but you just can't imagine it. So it's broken down to, to many problems that are two or three dimensional, but then you put them back together, you have something you can't imagine. So if someone asked me about what's a fourth dimension problem, I said, yep. I can, I can draw you a picture of a fourth dimension cube because the picture of a fourth dimension cube will be three dimensional. So when you draw a three dimensional cube, it is the shadow of a four dimensional cube. That's just a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anyone else? I think uh, design is a good angle on this because when we're modeling, it's all about what are the relationships between things. And often you find that there are a lot of concepts, a lot of ideas, and they sort of start winning on, winning them down, filtering them and combining them. And often they don't get put together quite right, where you have to, you're trying to factor 
four, five, six, seven things at one time and go, well, we always do it like this, except on the third Tuesday when the moon is full. And then you realize, you know, maybe we haven't gotten the right nuggets, the right principles. So I think there is professional, at least, computer science, modeling, a lot of things. That process really leads to clarity because the principles are stricter, you have fewer special cases, fewer balls spinning in the air and getting jungled. So uh, conceptual dimensionality reducing by just getting the concept and terms right is powerful. And the, and the short word, the single word for all of that is design, design process. Yes. Don, thank you. And that leads me right into where I was headed next, which, you know, is in a design problem. And, and what the point Hamming is trying to make in this chapter is we really have to now leave our comfort zone, you know, where we're comfortable talking about things in two or three dimensions and maybe even, um, according to Toby, maybe even four but now we really have to explore this n-dimensional space, right? And so he goes through a lot of math in this chapter to demonstrate that almost all of the volume in this n-dimensional sphere is on the surface, which in uh, design of experiments, we call the response surface when you have n-dimensions and you have a, a, a series of, you know, several parameters. And so, the optimal design is going to be somewhere on the surface and not necessarily inside the sphere, right? So it's going to be on the response surface. And, and I think the practicality of this, this particular lecture from Hamming is to provide inspiration as to where we should look for our optimal designs and just convince us that our intuitions about high dimensional space is probably not very good. It's something you really have to sit down and think about and, and, and it may not necessarily make sense to us when we just think about it unless we really work hard to think through it. What I find interesting, and this is kind of, I was driving these questions towards, I teach or as part of a course, I teach design of experiments, right? And so, the Seed Center here at MPS has a lot of tools that you can use to actually screen high dimensional design problems so that you can take a look at several, even uh, up to a hundred factors and you can use the design matrix to look at the parameters and then find, figure out very quickly which parameters are more important than others and reduce the problem. You know, this gets back to the reduced dimensionality we started with. Reduce it down to something that then can be analyzed. And, and so that I think is, is, was a big part of this chapter is that we have to understand that there, when we do experiments and we create designs, there are a ton of parameters and every parameter really contributes to the problem. And we have to do something to reduce the number of parameters in the problem. And he even states in there at some point during the lecture, you know, what he's trying to do for the students is that when they are presented with a new technology that they can actually look into the manufacturer and look at the different design specifications for that and then ask the critical questions to ensure that the designs are in fact optimal. And then he does a little bit of discussion and I have it here as the question, you know, the, the difference between an optimal design and a robust design and can you have both? So I would love to hear your thoughts on n-dimensional design problems um, or some experiences that you might have had with them? So I actually use snippets from this lecture when I'm teaching the intermediate programming course and talking about n-dimensional design from a slightly different standpoint than what you're looking at as an analyst, but from building computer programs 
and how to reason about what you're doing and reason, reasoning about testing what you're getting. So here we're actually having to deal with testing each individual parameter and, and what, what's going on with things. And I'm able to talk about all of this. And as you start adding more and more variables into a function that you're writing, you, you're artificially creating this larger design space. And that eventually you end up with a function where your chance of success is infinitesimally small and your chance to screw up, which is anything just outside the border, is infinitely large. And that, that that's bad. And that how can you actually try and decide later whether you're on the inside of this or on the outside of this? And, and that ends up uh, digressing back to elementary school number lines and talking about how to hook number lines together and just, you know, because each one of these variables is just a number because it's inside of a computer, whether it's a zero or a one or a true or a false or, or, or a more complex number, it's still just a number. And then wrapping all that together with Stephen King, who, who writes great horror stories and horror stories are an awesome allegory for being a computer programmer. Because when you think everything's going fine and you're at location XY on your Cartesian plane, but in reality, the safe zone is someplace at X plus 10 and Y plus 10. And so now you're on the wrong side of the line. It's just like being a protagonist in a Stephen King book. You think, you're where you're supposed to be. You're fat, dumb, and happy where you are, but you're on the evil side of the world and bad things are about to happen. And so all of those things can get wrapped together rather interestingly, you know, kind of illustrating the process of building a multi-dimensional widget, a computer function at a low level. Done with that. I don't know whether something I have learned in another class some year ago, statistics, <laughs> is uh, something that matches this question, but we had something with a nearly orthogonal Latin hypercube. Is this something that is matching this question? Yeah, that, well, in, in my world, when we're doing design analysis, that's exactly right. So you have resolution five fractional factorials, nearly orthogonal Latin cubes. And what that does is that helps you, helps you test your design space so you can hopefully figure out which parameters are more important than others. But yeah, but so the, the resolution five fractional factorials used to kind of reduce the dimensions and then the Latin hypercube would be used once you have a smaller set of dimensions to test the, the response surface and and figure out where the best designs might be. Okay, so once again, I learned something where the answer is in the book, but you can also use it for your education <laughs> five years down the road. Very good. Could I offer, uh, where this has helped me over the years is in the absence of clarity. When, when you push on a problem and it squishes in a different direction and I think we get acclimated to thinking that, well, if we just optimize and we rank our factors, we can get down to, to what are the, what is the right end number of things that if we can't do all of them, let's do the ones that matter. And that's good. But when you're, that's the briefing you'll get because people aren't briefing it otherwise or you know you're reading about it here's how we figured out most of this problem okay great well, what happens when nothing's working as planned when things are going sideways on you you get a couple of sideways motions and i went like okay wait hold everything uh, have we gotten back to our core concepts really have we subdivided this problem into the the aspects the dimension the metrics of it and uh, 
we'll see a little more of this later. And I think this is why having push n dimensional space early in the whole talk is because it ripples out a good thumb rule. I think Toby will probably tell us a little more about this is if you can't measure your factors, then maybe you haven't gotten crisp about your concepts and now your n dimensions are not really dimensions at all, but they're a, a hodgepodge of things that will not yield, will not be reduced to make sense. Okay. All right. Are there any more comments on n dimensional space before we move on? All right. Great. 